horrific activity to be sure, but doing it with a, with a rational basis. And so after 9-11, they couldn't bring up the mental defect story, so radicalization proved elusive. It, it, the, the cure for that, because it, it imagines a mental defect, but it, it's outside of the scope of, of uh, psychosocial science. So there's no diagnosis available. We can just know it when we see it. And uh, typically, when you look at the radicalization models that the government uses, they identify first member protected activities, beliefs, uh, associations, and political activity are all indicators of, of increasing dangerous down the radical, dangerousness down the radicalization pathway. So it's a way that the, the way the government put it is they, they couldn't wait until somebody actually was was blowing something up. They had to move left of boom. And the radicalization model provided a blueprint for who is left of of boom. So if you are a, a according to the FBI's uh, radicalization document, um, radicalization from conversion to jihad, it suggested that, that converting to Islam was the first step on this pathway. And then adopting Muslim dress or other customs, going to mosque, joining a Muslim social group, or involved, getting involved in political activity with other Muslim groups were all indicators of increasing danger. So it wasn't then surprising that we saw so much surveillance of Muslim communities uh, for no particular reason other than that they were Muslim American communities. I hope nobody here is engaged in any political activity. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're already in the university, which is one of the nodes of radicalization, so <laughs> two strikes. <laughs> um, so you write that the FBI appears to be immune to traditional efforts at oversight. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, it, I think the FBI poses a difficult problem for overseers because it is an essential agency in many ways. It, there are real criminals out there who would prey upon those that they could, and we need a force that is effectively a uh, tool to address that problem. We need uh, a, a, an agency that can work political corruption because that's something that, that harms uh, our confidence in government. Um, so we have to give this agency those kinds of tools that can so easily be abused. And because those tools can be targeted against the overseers themselves, it's sometimes risky for them to push too hard against the FBI. And they also want to make sure the FBI is effective in whatever jurisdiction they come from in protecting the community from different crime elements. So it's a little, I think, difficult from, as, a, as a problem with, without this history of abuse. And um, it, when a problem arises, like 9-11, it's much easier to just give them more authority and, and more uh, room to do work secretly rather than say, no, obviously 9-11 was was an example of how dysfunctional this agency had been. We should use this as an opportunity to rip the lid off this organization and see what's really wrong with it. So it does present a problem in the best case scenario, but we also have seen uh, significantly that, that FBI officials are willing to um, tell Congress things that sound nice but aren't necessarily true, particularly about how it's using its own authorities. And when the, a secretive agency can mislead its overseers, it's very hard for the overseers to understand what's, what's real, whether uh, some abuse, a perfect example, there was a, one of the first things I worked on uh, at the ACLU, there was um, Freedom of Information Act requests uh, and Privacy Act requests by a number of political organizations that felt in the aftermath of 9-11 they were being spied on by the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So the ACLU helped them do a, a nationwide privacy act request for information. And it turned out, sure enough, the FBI was engaged in a lot of spying, including against a group in, in uh, Pennsylvania uh, called the Murder Center for Peace and Justice. And when that came out that this agency that was well respected in the community was being spied on, Congress wanted to know more. And what, Congress, what the FBI told Congress was, well, 
this was all part of a different investigation. There was some Muslim terrorist who just happened to be attending this anti-war rally, and the surveillance was based on this other investigation. We weren't actually spying on the, the Mervin Center, and that turned out to be entirely false. Um, and uh, we, so that makes it very difficult because in addition to the expansive powers, we've also given them a much thicker cloak of secrecy. And when there is that kind of secrecy, it's easy to manipulate what facts that are come out to the public's attention and what doesn't. And, and I think that makes it very hard for members of Congress who have a, a, an interest in reform from generating the kind of public support that's necessary to make that happen because they can't make the the story understandable to the public because so much of it is secret. Um, you just you described the FBI in your book as a quote lawless agency, which I think obviously may come as a surprise to people given that you're a former agent. What, do you, what precisely do you mean by law? Uh, so I use that uh, because it technically is lawless. Um, when it was created in, in, in 1908, it didn't have a charter. Congress didn't say this is what the agency should do, and this is how it should do it. Um, so it had always been operating just through exec executive fiat. The president told the FBI what to do, and, and it did that. Um, so the, the limitations on the FBI didn't exist, and they didn't exist until uh, after J. Edgar Hoover died, when the church committee, which I have the pleasure of working with Chris Schwartz, who was chief counsel of the church committee, um, did an incredible, really the only comprehensive exact examination of our intelligence agencies and found widespread abuse. Uh, the effort was for Congress to write a legislative charter that would uh, limit the FBI's investigative powers, but instead the Attorney General Edward Levy stepped forward and said, I'll issue guidelines. And uh, those guidelines, just like the Harlan Fitch Stone reforms were intended to focus the FBI where there was a reasonable indication of illegal activity. So again, restore it to its function as a law enforcement agency. Um, but because they're attorney general guidelines, every attorney general can modify them, and most do. And uh, incrementally, they've moved somewhat stronger, some, somewhat less, um, until 2001. And after 9-11, Attorney General John Ashcroft significantly loosened the guidelines. And then again in 2008, under Attorney General Michael Casey, they were extensively rewritten to the point where now, under the FBI's guidelines, the FBI can conduct an investigation of you called an assessment with no factual basis to believe anyone has committed a crime. And these investigations can be very intrusive. They can involve not just physical surveillance, uh, you know, subpoenas for your telephone records, uh, subscriber information and other account subscriber information, uh, the recruitment and tasking of informants, so they can recruit, recruit somebody to infiltrate your group to find information again without any basis to believe anybody has done anything wrong. So, so that's what I mean by lawless. They're they're not bound by the law. I, FBI leadership is frequently invoked the benefits of diversity. But the Bureau seems to actually, I mean, if you look at statistics, they seem to actually be struggling more with recruiting, uh, with diversifying their staff than they have in the past. Uh, why is that? Um, so when I joined the FBI in 1988, uh, it was almost 20 years after J. Edgar Hoover had died, and every director was trying to, or at least spoke to, the need to diversify the agency. And every year, it was getting better. It, it still never approached looking like the rest of America, but it, you could see improvement. Um, that improvement was not um, it was not easy. Uh, when I was a young agent, uh, there was a class action suit by, by uh, women agents, there was a class action suit by Latino agents, and there was a separate class action suit by black agents. So there were problems that discrimination problems that, that continue to exist inside the agency, but you could see that there was some progress being made, and, and I believe the lawsuits were forcing even more progress to be made. Um, but after 9-11, we saw a retrenchment, and I, I personally believe that that's because of the shift to a national security focus. 
that when you're away from law enforcement, you're no longer looking at people you can prove are breaking the law, and instead looking at people who might be national security threats. It's very easy, just part of human nature, to see people who have a different life experience from you as being more dangerous, more of a risk. And so when you have an agency that's still overwhelmingly white, it's easy for the normal security protocols that, have, that are applied to a, an applicant to look more critically at somebody who doesn't look like the rest of the FBI. And particularly, I, I go through a number of case studies in the book of, of agents who, who came under suspicion because of their religion, or Muslim agents, or because of their national origin, because their family was from or they were born in a, in a particular foreign country. And that when there are small problems, those are magnified because there's already this suspicion. And it's a lot easier uh, to, to disrupt in the book is, is based, and the title is based on the uh, uh, concept that the FBI pulled from the Hoover era, Cohen Pelpro era, called the disruption strategy, where they feel that even if you can't prove somebody is committing a crime, you 